Welcome to the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance Seven to Save nomination information session. Uh, this virtual gathering is meant to serve as an introduction to our program, the nomination process, and what impact the listing can have on properties in New Hampshire. I am Nicole Flynn, uh, Field Services Representative for the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, and I am joined today by our Executive Director, uh, Jennifer Goodman. And also we have some longtime preservation advocates from past seven to save listees here as well. Lori Carey, Paula Gilman, and Sue Kelly LeClerc, who will speak about their properties and experience with their seven to save listing. Um, today's program is going to be broken up into three parts with an introduction to our program, followed by discussion of the past uh, projects, um, Kimball Jenkins in Concord, um, Kelly Corner Schoolhouse in Gilmanton, and the First Baptist Church in Gilmanton. Um, if you could, please introduce yourself in the chat and uh, tell us if you have a project in mind or are part of a past uh, Seven to Save listee. Um, and we will be opening it up at the end to uh, the nomination form the process and um, answer any questions that you may have about that going forward. All right. The New Hampshire Preservation Alliance created the Seven to Save program in 2006 with a focus uh, to focus attention and resources on significant historic properties in New Hampshire that are underutilized, threatened by neglect, have insufficient funding, or are at risk of unsympathetic development. Nominations are solicited in the summer with an announcement of the seven to save list in mid-October. The program is designed based on the 11 most endangered list sponsored by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, we, cre we created this list um, after the Daniel Webster farm in Franklin was added to the 2005 11 most endangered list. Um, so, what are the benefits of the program at this time? Um, Jennifer, you can uh, sure. give us some information on that. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, as Nicole just said, we wanted to bring sort of the model that we had seen on the national level to New Hampshire and really uh, wanted to design it to meet the kind of benefits, the kind of goals described here on the slide. So um, giving greater visibility to preservation needs, helping uh, landmarks around the state, um, really thinking of the seven to save list in, as, listing as sort of an accelerant, a way to spark um, new interests, new ideas, new resources for a property that's in need. Um, so I think it's a, a, a tool that can be really beneficial and help different kinds of properties in different kinds of ways. Um, in, in terms of the listing itself, we use it as a way to kind of prioritize assistance. So our statewide nonprofit organization offers some priority assistance to um, properties that are listed on Seven to Save. Um, that spark, that extra recognition um, certainly helps, helps um, with different kinds of stakeholders and different kinds of decision makers, including funders. Um, and spe specifically, I would just mention that I know the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program that we're so proud and um, fortunate to have in New Hampshire um, looks favorably on seven to save listees. So um, really designed to be an ex to, to spark that extra um, kinds of interest, access to dollars, access to positive decisions that helps save more special places around the state. So as part of the nomination process, uh, nominations are looked at for their criteria of eligibility. And so the selection of that, uh, Jennifer, if you want to talk about what those yeah. are. These are the three big areas that we look at, historic significance, the imminence, and I'd say character of the threat, and the potential impact of the listing. So with the significance, why is it special related to its architecture, its maybe a social or community history, people involved in it um, over time, um, 
so making the case about its significance is important, whether it's already been considered on or eligible for the state or national register uh, is an important threshold to be conveying or communicating in a nomination because that significance is one of these major three criteria um, considerations. Um, the threat is uh, another, obviously, here on this list of three. Um, it could look much differently in different kinds of uh, situations, could be an external threat, um, pressure in terms of land use or development, um, could be more internal or related to the sustainability or health of a, a building or structure, lack of investment, need for a new user, new investment, new plan going forward. Um, this last one is really important too, that we look at in the selection process, the potential impact of the listing. Um, how can seven to save listing make a difference in terms of the transformation to a, a threatened property to a, a successful um, rescued, revived uh, landmark kind of uh, property? Um, I'd say all of these criteria are important. When I look back at past lists, there's certainly um, years where in the list of seven, there might be some where they got a higher ranking in terms of significance and less in terms of threat. There could be another year where, or another uh, property on that list of seven that's shifted the other direction. Um, uh, so all of those things are important um, to, to, be, uh, to make the case and as we select, those are the three big things that we're looking at. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so since 2006, 105 properties have been listed to the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance's seven to save list in 68 towns across the state. And that includes eight thematic statewide listings, including state historic sites, metal truss bridges, historic windows, granges, historic family farms, seacoast historic resources, general stores, and main streets. Um, so at this time, we're going to open it up to our panelists here. Yes, Jennifer. I could just talk a little bit more to that slide, oh, Nicole, sure. in terms of who can nominate and what kind of um, things get nominated. You want me of to do course. that? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that anybody can nominate um, a property to seven to save. Um, you can have a close association or not close association and still be a nominator. Um, we're accepting and seeing all kinds of um, building types, residential, commercial, institutional, uh, often a building but can be a structure. Um, also have welcomed nominations for um, historic resources that are more landscape oriented, could be a historic cemetery, could be a historic farm could be a combination of properties that have significance um, together. Um, so Nicole, do you want me to talk a little bit about what makes it and what doesn't related to the criteria or do you want me to save that for later? Um, you can talk about it now, that would okay, be good. Great, great. Thanks. I mean, we often get questions about what, make, what makes it and what doesn't um, in terms of the seven. Um, and I would just say kind of back to the criteria that we were talking about before, um, it, it, it's often related to uh, information or timing, I think, in terms of the, the nominations that don't make the list. Um, maybe the, um, the, nomination, the nominator hasn't collected enough information on the significance of the property yet. Um, maybe that whole, um, to, the, to the criteria about ability to make a difference, um, that the, there isn't conveyed the sort of level of stakeholders or potential for additional community support. So I think those are themes for us when we look at properties nominated that haven't made the list, um, what, 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 what their negative marks uh, associated with them are. Um, but I would just close this section by also just mentioning it's a competitive process and um, Nominations in effect because it's seven are competing against each other in a given year. Um, so some years it's just harder to get a certain kind of resource with a certain set of criteria across the finish line to get listed than other years. So those are just some kind of big picture points I wanted to make about um, criteria and how we look at nominations that come in. 
Thank you, Jennifer. All right. So the first of our featured Seven to Save listees, um, this one is a project by um, with Lori Carey. Uh, she is a New Hampshire native and small business owner and devoted years of volunteer service to education and the arts, serving on boards of public, private, and charter schools, graduate degrees in both public affairs and nonprofit management from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And she is in uh, involved in local government through service on planning board, economic development, police commission, conservation commission, um, heritage commission, hazard mitigation, parks and recreation, as well as being chair of the town of Bosco and select board. Um, I have a lot more on her <laughs> stats here if you want me to continue. Um, she has served as the, on the advisory board for UNH Cooperative Extension um, at the county level and a past New Hampshire state representative served as clerk for the committee on state and federal relations and veteran affairs in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Um, and one of her big saves was uh, nominating the Kimball Jenkins estate um, as uh, one of her successful nominations to the seven to save list. So Lori, thank you for joining us. And um, at this time, I wanted to uh, have you discuss some of the reasons why you nominated it and how the nomination um, and listing helped uh, further that project. Right, um, and this was certainly a process and Kimball Jenkins as a nonprofit went through an evolution, I, I would say. It's um, the last owner, the seventh generation of the Kimball family to live in the estate, died in 1981 and left the estate uh, to the people. Uh, unfortunately, there was a, an error in the, her will, which left the estate penniless, but to the people. So the original board of trustees had to do a lot of fundraising. They did an excellent job raised money, hired a full-time nonprofit executive director, and then things kind of fell apart. There was some embezzlement um, going on among employees who, and you know, the individual did get put in jail uh, for their part of it, but it left the organization again penniless and again without an executive director. So those were the sort of the internal threats and a new board came on, excellent a group of people, Bill Chapman, Gary Shirk, Sherry Young, Steve Metzger, and highly motivated, put together a business plan. They were doing all the right things. And then we had an external threat and the external threat was flooding on 393 that flooded into the estate like Niagara Falls. So not only did you have the internal, um, reorganization going on, but you had this external physical threat and that water cascading over 393 like Niagara Falls um, created huge potholes. I mean, that children could drop into in the uh, pavement on the estate. It uh, washed at the foundation. So it, it really was a, a terrible physical threat. The problem was getting people's attention. And I think this is where the seven to save really made a difference. Um, I spoke to my colleagues on the board and I said, you know, why don't we nominate Kimball Jenkins for seven to save? It's a great historical research source. It's one of the few examples in our state of uh, architectural design by Amos Cutting, who also designed the state library. I said, it seems to me that in addition to being a fabulous nonprofit for the School of Art, we're also a great architectural resource and part of Concord's history. Now Concord had never had a successful seven to save in the, in the capital city. So this would have been back then in 2013, the first uh, seven to save that the city of Concord had ever attempted. So we got the mayor behind it. We got um, the chamber of commerce behind it. We got cultural resources behind it, the commission of cultural resources. We really reached out in the community get people behind this nomination. And it was successful. And as a result of that success, it gave us some additional points in terms of going after uh, LCHIP money, which we did. We just finished a half million dollar project to restore the roof. And as you know, if you can get the roof to stop leaking, you can fix everything else inside. Uh, we've also uh, been working on the porches, which are another uh, thing we've uh, 
been able to get some additional funding through the 1772 Foundation to assist with that. So it really set into motion a succession of positive events for uh, Kimball Jenkins estate. And in addition, it gave us this opportunity to educate the public about preservation. So during COVID, actually the timing was somewhat good, terrible for fundraising, but good in terms of getting work done. We were able to have people participate in Zoom calls, have the craftspeople who were working on the estate show people how preservation works, have them see visually this is a rotted out beam. This is what we're doing to replace it. Uh, this is why. So it really engaged the public further than the nonprofit have, had ever engaged them in the past because we had this ability to, to bring them in via Zoom as well as physically bring them in once COVID um, loosened up a little. So it's been a, a fabulous opportunity. And I would say, had we not gotten that seven to save nomination, I don't think we would have gotten the LCHIP money. I don't think we would have been able to create awareness in the public. I know it put for us a little pressure on both the state and the city government to address the damage that was being created by the 393 intersection in the water uh, overflow. It was interesting. It got the state legislature involved and the um, DOT for the state of New Hampshire in terms of trying to create engineering solutions to a long-standing problem, which with all our, you know, our hundred-year floods that are happening like every week now, um, it, it caused them to, to create a solution after years of, of neglect. So can't say enough. <laughs> um. I, I just, I loved how you described that, Lori, and I would say that, um, your description of how the, the outreach work that you did to put together the nomination is, you know, blue ribbon style, right? And even folks that kind of aren't at that level yet, I think I've heard that just the process of going through the nomination, whether you get it or not, is kind of that step in sort of capacity building. Who are the people you're going to need to be reaching out to? Um, how do you tell your story? That sort of thing. So. Right. And, and it put into, you guys have been doing an incredible job. Kudos. Yeah, it put into um, motion a lot of residual positive impacts, too, and that now Kimball Jenkins does have a full time executive director, which really any nonprofit to be successful needs that. But I think once you have all these projects going and grants going, because as uh, folks may or may not be aware, there's a lot of paperwork involved with grant work. So you really need to be professional about that and invest in your staff. And I think that's another thing that a good residual that came out of the seven to save the realization that having professional full-time staff is very important to the success of the organization in the project. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask Lori um, about her project? Uh, you can put your question in the chat and we'll come back to them after we discuss the other two projects. Um, next, we have projects by uh, Paula Gilman and Susan Kelly Leclerc. Uh, these are projects that are very close to their home and their hearts. Paula is a seventh generation Gilman in Gilmanton. Her ancestor, Edward Gilman, and his family left um, England in 1638 and arrived in Massachusetts later that year. Um, the first Gilman uh, to set foot in America was her ancestor, Edward, um, and eventually worked his way from Massachusetts to Exeter, New Hampshire, and then on to Gilmanton. Um, I'm going to truncate a little bit of your history there. Sorry, Paula. Um, Gilmanton was not settled until 1761 because of uh, threats from the native populations. Um, the first settlers arrived in Lower Gilmanton in 1761. And um, in the spring of 1762, um, Samuel Gilman and his family uh, arrived in Lower Gilmanton from Exeter. First meeting house was built in 1773. And um, by 1841, that meeting house had begun to deteriorate and they decided to build another uh, meeting house there. 
and her seventh great grandfather, uh, Antipas Gilman, along with uh, other townspeople, deeded the meeting house to the um, First Baptist Society and Religious Association. Um, you can correct me if I'm catching some of this incorrectly, Paula. Um, where the First Baptist Church of Lower Gilmington stands now. The other project that we're talking about first is the first school that was erected in Lower Gilmington on land where Sue Kelly Leclerc built her house. Um, it was deteriorated and later relocated to its current location and is now known as the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse shown in these pictures. And in 1778, it was designated as school number one. Uh, Paula is totally immersed in preserving Lower Gilmington and the first village Lower Gilmington uh, Community Club with both Sue and Paula who are members recognizes that the time has come to dedicate all of their efforts to pre preservation of their historic and cultural resources so that they may live on for future generations just like they're caring for the uh, work of their ancestors. Um, I'll quickly introduce Kelly, or I'm sorry, Susan Kelly Leclerc. Uh, sixth generation of Kelly's living on Kelly land in Lower Gilmanton. Uh, paternal descendants resided in Gilmanton for several centuries and um, Gales arriving in the 1700s. That's another side of your family, I'm guessing. Um, the mm -hmm. Kelly's arriving in 1802. Kelly Corner Schoolhouse is located right down the road from the Dr. Benjamin Kelly Homestead, local doctor serving surrounding area. And his home was a stagecoach stop, a post office, and a place where the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse teacher could uh, have board. Dr. Kelly was also one of the original signers of the First Baptist Church's constitution. Uh, Susan is following in the Kelly and Gale family's longstanding tradition of being active in Gilmington and the Kelly's Corner Corner Schoolhouse and the First Baptist Church have been a very special place for her. Uh, paternal descendants for many generations and for the local community. And she desires to keep the buildings restored for future generations of Gilmanton residents. And it continues today with her family. Uh, Paula and Susan, would you like to uh, tell us some about specifically the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse and why you uh, nominated it for the Seven to Save and how that listing helped. Yeah. Okay, we're fighting over who's gonna start. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to jump in with each other, so that's how we operate. We do. Well, the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse is special to both of us um, in that, of course, it's the Kelly Corner School. There were Kelly teachers, there were Kelly children. At, um, going there, it's special to me because my grandmother taught there my mother and her siblings all went to the school. And when we were younger, the Lower Gilman Community Club used to host functions. They would have a blueberry festival, strawberry festival, harvest festival. And after eating, there would be a local band and just community gatherings. But um, it got to the point where this place really needed some help, uh, a lot of structural concerns. And we just, Sue and I just couldn't let it go. So our dear friend, um, Carolyn Baldwin, and I think that name resonates with Jennifer um, and others who are involved in this. Carolyn said to us, well, have you, he, she said, well, why don't you apply to Seven to Save? And we went, oh, really? <laughs> so we did. And that's what got us on the road to this. Um, yeah. I think you need to have a passion, and I think we've heard this from our other present presenter. You need to have a passion about a particular building, and if you don't have that passion, I think it's going to be hard to fill out um, a seven to save application. You need to, you need to, have, yeah, you need to have ownership of these particular buildings. Um, we found out that at, at one point, the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse that the Lower Gilmington uh, Community Club has. Um, rented for years and years and years um, was going to be possibly sold um, to a person in town and moved. Um, that was our catalyst to, um, to do something very quickly. Um, and that's when we decided that this was definitely our passion. We had talked about it, but we needed this to get us, get us motivated. 
um, the president, I'm, I'm also on the Gilmanton Historical Society and the president, John Dickey, back in 2016, I think, or something like that, sent a letter to the members of the Gelmonton Historical Society with a copy of the letter received by the school board saying, like Sue said, this individual had recently moved here from Naples, Florida and wanted to re relocate the Kelly Corner School closer to the elementary school. My comment was, <laughs> no way in hell over my dead body is this school going to move? And as Sue said, that was the impetus. We talked about it and talked about it. And we said, okay, done. This is, this is what we're going to do. And we also had found out that there were 18 other one-room schoolhouses in Gilmington over the years, not all operating at the same time, but they were, they could have been operating if they, if the population needed them to be. Um, this, believe it or not, um, is the only one-room schoolhouse still owned by the school district in Gilmington, which at that still, and at that point, they didn't really recognize that they had owned this building for all these years. So again, it was something that, um, you know, it's near, to, near and dear to us, and we decided that we needed to do something. And again, thanks to Carolyn Baldwin, she said, let's just go for it. Let's just try. We need work done. Let's, we've already have it on the um, state register. Let's go for seven to save. Let's get the outside um, taking care of the electric and the drainage and all of this. So we, like I said, we had the passion, we had to do something and thank goodness, um, yeah, we did. And we, and we were super pleased when we got um, our email confirmation that we had um, received seven to save. It was a very special day for all the hard work um, we don't have anyone to do the work other than Paul and myself. <laughs> so there's a lot of work involved. Um, um, we do have a friend that's a grant writer and um, she was able to help us uh, immensely with this project. But again, with the seven to save, it, it got recognition from the local people that how important this um, building is um, to be saved. The last one room schoolhouse left in Gilmington still standing in the same location. Um, and, you know, actually, we're really glad. I mean, we have right now back to back projects, restoration projects, thanks to Seven to Save. And it was, I'm glad we did the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse first, because like Sue said, neither one of us had ever done anything like this before. We had no clue what we were in for. But this was a great learning curve. Phase one uh, of the restoration for the school was a great learning curve down the road when we applied for the First Baptist Church. We learned what to do, what not to do. Um, but the, the biggest thing that I, I, I really believe, the biggest thing that helped us is media. Media, media, media. Um, we created a Facebook page for the Kelly Corner School and we kept blasting them with photos of the progress, the before and after. Um, and everywhere we went, I mean, I think people got tired of listening to us. We went, seven to save, we're doing the school, we're doing the school. <laughs> but like Sue says, you have to be passionate. And if you don't have that passion, people are going to go, yeah, okay. Um, anything else? And, and we love the, the, um, the little logo or seven to save brings attention to resources to threaten and endangered historic properties throughout New Hampshire. That was, that was something that we put in. Um, our donor letters, um, because it is, if, if someone doesn't do something, the next generation is not gonna understand what a one room schoolhouse looks like. And it's important to get that out because so many people in our area have moved in from other parts of our country and need to understand that this is, this was what life was like um, in Lower Gilmington, which happens to be the first village of Gilmington um, when it first started. So that's what we have. And feel free to ask us questions or what we can add um, to what we have said. Uh, if you have any questions about the project, the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse, you can put it in the chat and we can come back to it later, but we'll move on to the First Baptist Church of Gilmanton. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, I can't even begin to tell you how excited we were when we were once again nominated for seven to save, you know, um, Passion. We were jumping up and down, yelling, and it's like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Um, and again, um, it's the prestige 
of having a seven to save nomination. Um, I, I, I just can't begin to say thank you enough to seven to save because once we told people, they go, what's seven to save? And then we told them, like, whoa, helped us with our grants. Um, it helped us with our donors. And like Sue says, when we sent out letters to the donors, we would always include seven to save and everything else. Um, I don't know. The seven to save application on this one is pretty interesting. Again, we have to applaud <laughs> Carolyn Baldwin. She keeps us. Yeah, Carolyn comes through when we need her to come through. Um, we have done a lot of work in, in Paulus upstairs, um, writing grants and trying to stay organized. Um, it's nice if you could hire somebody, but we're free of charge. So <laughs> no. we, do, we do a lot of work together and we meet a lot. And um, yeah, Carolyn sent us an email and said, do you realize that seven to save application is due and you really need to do something about it? And I'm like, we're like, oh yeah, that was on our list of things to do. And um, so she started it and she goes, unfortunately it's due tomorrow. So we, yeah, so we spent a long time that day to write the seven to save application. So we followed Carolyn's footsteps and followed her directions and we did write it. And we were um, thoroughly impressed by when we got our nomination, because again, we, we forced ourselves, we knew it was that important um, and we did it and we did well with it. and. Um, yeah, that was our first banner that went up. Um, so we made sure that banner got right up as soon as we got the banner. Um, yeah, it went right up on the building so people could see that, yes, it is a church. Um, it's interesting that this particular church, what, the vestry upstairs was used by the Lower Gilmington Community Club um, as for their um, gatherings and their ham and bean dinners. And unfortunately it got too small. So that's when they um, leased the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse for their functions. So this building um, ties into the Lower Gilmington Community Club, which Paul and I are current members and our um, family have been members throughout the years. So yeah, they're, in, they're within close proximity of each other, but our families are very much tied to these buildings. Um, and again, we need to do a shout out to um, Andrew Cushing at this particular point too. He thoroughly helped us um, with the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance um, assessment. Um, and again, with seven to save and with our assessment, we were able to figure out um, what really needed to get done um, and to what to put in um, to our donor letter, um, you know, mentioning we got seven to save and this is why we have to save it because of these issues um, and issues you may not see from the outside. It's more than the outside. It's also the inside structure. So before picture and as Paula mentioned media um, one of the things that we had seen around seen around different areas um, that were seven to save or were looking for L chip money um, we saw the thermometer so we look, uh, contacted one of our local ministers that does um, some of our summer services at the church and we said we really need a thermometer to show how how fundraising is going so one thermometer. No, we have one going from the north side and one coming from the south side so we can show people. Um, and as soon as I think we got $2,000, every $2,000 increment, Paula and I would go up and we have a slide presentation if you'd like to see that at some point. <laughs> Monthly, weekly, we'd have our picture taken um, just to, again, to continue to show, you know, movement. Um, it didn't have to be big movement. It was just tiny little um, increments. And the funny thing with this is we made all our money during COVID. We were shocked that we made all of our $100,000 during COVID. Um, again, mentioning seven to save, um, important building that needs to be saved for Lower Gilmanton. Um, and yeah, we, we made all of our money. I mean, we kept saying that, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for during these difficult times, understanding the value of this particular um, structure. So again, we can't, we can't thank everybody that worked with us um, to get this to where it is today. People would actually go by when we're raising the thermometer and toot the horn <laughs> and wave, or they'd email us or see us on the street wow, this is great. You guys are making great progress. And we also, as the Lower Gilmanton Community Club, when um, the annual town report comes out, they have asked us to include a report. So we did both 
the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse and the First Baptist Church. And so more media going out and then more people contacted us. So yeah, I mean, we could go on forever, but- we'll Yeah, great emphasis on just the importance of communication and how you use the listing, how you knew your different kinds of audiences and how you had to meet them. Um, Thanks. You also did a nice little advertisement for our building assessment program. You were talking about the roadmap that you had done with some funds from the Preservation Alliance. And in turn, I would um, um, thank LCHIP. Uh, I know George Bourne is in this group for um, investing in that program of the Preservation Alliances. So in turn, we can, um, on a, in a competitive way, um, provide those kind of uh, grant monies to help groups create those kind of building assessment roadmaps to. Um, yeah, and one of the big things too, Jennifer, during the, the church, um, at one point you had a full, you had, there was a full assessment that could be done for a certain amount of money. Yeah. And um, working with Andrew, we were able to get a smaller assessment done that we physically could finance, um, yeah. which, was, which was really, really nice because we didn't need to have a full one. We only needed to have a partial and, um, yeah, with you know finances being tight in the beginning to get things done. Um, yeah, I mean, it was nice that you made that adjustment for us and for others. Thank yep. you. Yep, thank you for saying that. Um, so incredible volunteer energy, love your commitment to use of that word passion, <laughs> your fuel <laughs> as you went through all of this and uh, brought a lot, lot of other folks behind you to get really excited about these projects, obviously, to be so successful. Mm. Oh, um, if anyone has any other questions, there was one about um, uh, how did the seven to save designation help with your fundraising? I think Paula and Susan have uh, uh, answered that. And if you have any other specific questions, you can reach out to me and I can forward them along to um, Paula and Sue after the program. But at this time, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, nomination process and uh, what the steps are in it. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything to add at this time before we move on? No? Okay. Um, so the Seven to Save program, uh, as we mentioned before, nominations are open in the summer and um, they are due. Uh, Friday, September uh, 10th at noon. Um, and we have a committee of board members and other interested um, advocates for preservation who um, review those nominations and make recommendations uh, to who should be listed this year. And these are some of our past listees here and some of the announcement events. The announcement event is going to be in mid-October and we'll be announcing uh, the date of that and the location um, when uh, soon we'll be announcing that. Um, but it's a great time to have um, not only uh, highlight those projects that uh, achieved listing for that year, but also to um, talk with other projects and get some other ideas and um, to also give some information to the participants in that announcement event. Um, you can see here, uh, we offer space during that time, uh, during the announcement to set up a table with some information and um, some displays about your project. So um, going on to the, the nitty gritty of the application process itself, you can find the application and information on our website, uh, nhpreservation.org slash seven hyphen two hyphen save. Um, the nomination form is here. Uh, registration for this program will be replacing that with this video. And then um, we also have a survey for past seven to save listies. So you can give us an update on how your project is going. And um, if you need any additional help from the Preservation Alliance with keeping your progress going. Um, this is the 2021 Seven to Save nomination form. It's a fillable PDF that's available on our website and the basic information that's included on here. We need the name of the property. You can include current names as well as the any historic names that you may have. The 
owner of the property, their address, if it's different than the building address, the contact information, the type of ownership, is it a public owned structure or is it privately owned? And the contact person for that, if it's different than the owner. Um, the current use, and if there's a proposed use uh, change, um, you can put that there. And also current designation uh, status of the property, if it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places or State Register or any local designations. And then your information the, the, as the nominator so that we can contact you with any questions that we may have. Um, in a separate document, we ask you to answer the nomination questions. And those include the significance of the property, uh, historical, architectural, cultural, et cetera. What are the threats to the property? Um, possible solutions to those threats, as well as what the community benefits would be if the building was to be saved or the property would be to be saved. And a list of others who support saving the property. And then you're going to email that as well as the, this nomination form along with photographs, uh, a map of the location and any additional materials. Um, and you can contact us with any questions or issues that you have when in filling out this form. So at this time, if anyone has any questions for us um, or if Jennifer has any more comments. Um, no? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So one of the things I'd like to mention is going through the process of seven to save. Um, Paul and I had questions after questions after questions after questions, and we constantly were emailing back and forth um, with, to the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. And we have to thank you immensely for letting us do that and responding to us because we could not have done it without you know, your direction and telling us that we were doing it the right way or you needed to do that. It was just awesome to make sure we had everything that we needed. And the checklist is fabulous because it keeps you organized um, when you have to make sure that you have everything and everything handed in on time. So thank you for all your help. Oh, you're welcome. And I'd say even before you get to that point, if you want to, um, Nicole would be your prime contact. We'd be happy to chat with you just uh, uh, um, if you're considering nominating and you just want help thinking through um, whether you're well positioned to nominate, we're happy to have that even more preliminary conversation with anybody who's considering a nomination. And then, um, as you just said, ha happy to answer questions throughout the process for sure. Did I see that one of the people on the uh, Zoom today is from Cornish? Yep, and she's a she's a veteran of a national nomination too. I might we don't have to put her on the spot, but I was thinking back to other most endangered national nominations, and um, another one we've had from New Hampshire has been the Memorial Bridge in Portsmouth. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty neat property that um, Stephanie wrote about in the chat in Cornish. Well, uh, my daughter happens to live in Cornish, so uh, I will be glad to volunteer her to uh, help you with your project. <laughs> right. Stephanie has done a lot of good things in Portsmouth, based in Portsmouth. We'll be in touch. That sounds good. Um, Anything else? I mean, I guess I would just make the broad point too that um, Seven to Save is just one of our programs. So we're, we're here to help in all kinds of different ways with um, special places around the state. Um, Nicole, do you want me to close or do you think there's, does anybody else have any questions? Um, we can do the uh, sponsor stuff and the close out stuff. And then if anyone has any specific questions, we'll stop the recording and we can answer those for you. Um, I, I wanna thank Paula and Sue and Lori for sharing their expertise and being such great advocates for these projects. Um, they are often featured in our communications because they are wonderful uh, examples of what preservation can do when you have um, technical expertise and advocacy and just some people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and get down to work. Um, so Jennifer. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs>
Well said. Yeah, I'll add my thanks as well. And uh, really inspiring to hear those stories um, from you three. Um, again, the Preservation Alliance is here to help. Um, want to help with these community projects, want to help with all different kinds of um, property ownership and stewardship issues. Uh, we're the non nonprofit statewide organization. Um, just, you know, we're, we're fueled by the passion of people like you who are doing this work on the ground every day. Uh, we're fortunate to have great business sponsors. Um, here's a slide that shows you our current list of seven to save business sponsors. Um, we also um, depend on contributions from people like you. Uh, donations from individuals are the biggest part of our annual operating budget by far. Um, so thank you to all of you who are already donors. Even a little bit makes a big difference. If you're already a member or supporter, consider a, um, a gift membership or a pay it forward kind of gift on somebody else's behalf. Um, be on the lookout for other programs that we're doing this summer and fall um, geared towards uh, property owners, also geared towards folks like you who are leading community projects. Um, and specifically, uh, and, and you'll get the date for the Seven to Save um, announcement event soon, as Nicole said. Um, so watch out, watch for upcoming programs, um, stay connected to us in different kinds of ways. And then uh, specifically related to this program, I know Nicole will be sending a follow-up that has a survey link and we'd, we'd welcome your um, input on this program, but also ideas for future programs and events. So yes. thanks everybody very, very much. Thank you. If, if I could do a, a quick shout out, I wanna make an observation. In, in all the years I've been involved in preservation projects, I will say that all those who are experts in the preservation field, whether they're painters or, um, or in the construction trades, all those people, in addition to having incredible craftsmanship, are incredibly generous with their time and um, quite frankly, their talent. And I know very often there are many projects they do for which they do not get paid in the way a normal contractor gets paid. They donate that to the nonprofits that they help. So a shout out to, uh, in Kibble Jenkins' case, Mark Hopkins and Rob Zielinski uh, for the amount of time they donated above and beyond what they were ever paid for to ensure and to for that pride of having a finished project because um, small nonprofits cannot afford very often what needs to be done. And these folks have the passion and the commitment to see a project through sometimes regardless of the funding. So a big thank you to those in the preservation community. Um, many of the people who are sponsors of this uh, particular uh, Zoom call know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. Well said, Lori. Thank you for thank you for sharing oh, that. Lori, that Lori, Sue and I totally agree with you. Um, Steve Bedard is a treasure. Uh, we're very fortunate that Steve lives in town. He's in Kilman tonight. <laughs> but um, Steve and we we also have Steve Fifield of Restoration and Relocation from Chichester. Oh my word, we are so lucky to have him. And he's, he's walking us through the church. He's giving us the history of the church. And well, this was done because of this and that. And, you know, well, do you, do you need some money? He's like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll give you a bill whenever, you know, it's like these people are passionate. And again, that word passion, they're passionate about what they do and they're meticulous and we adore them and thank you for hooking us up with them. Mm -hmm.